So if we could, um, I'm going to convene the meeting tonight. Is everybody ready? No. They're trying to get the. Uh, well, they're trying to get the computer ready. You're good. Okay, I just want to make sure you got the computer ready. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm not federal. Uh, Bob Taylor tonight, uh, as federal, is at a something. CSAC. All right, there we go. All right, could we all uh, rise for our pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Public comments. At this time, the public is invited to address the authority regarding any item that is not on the agenda. And we do have a speaker card, and it is Mr. Bruce Olson. This is the only speaker card I have, so uh, I want to have one more. All right. Bruce, you're up. Good. Thank you to staff. I am Bruce Olson, resident of Pittsburgh. I rode my bicycle to this meeting. It was 17 miles. A couple of months ago, I spoke to you about riding my bicycle to this meeting. A little segment of it includes being on the freeway. And at the end of the meeting, during uh, commissioner comments, one of the commissioners asked staff, so how do we tell which segments of freeway allow bicycles and which segments of freeway do not? And that's a very good question. The highway patrol bicyclists as well as elected officials need to know this information. And there's a sign at every entrance to the freeway, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices Sign number R5-10A is at every freeway entrance. It says pedestrians, bicycles, motor driven cycles prohibited unless, of course, were permitted, in which case the bicycle part has a piece of white reflective tape over it. But this sign kind of blends into the background, and you are to be forgiven if you haven't noticed it. But now, tonight, or the next time you're out in your car getting on the freeway, you're going to look. It, it has to be in the daytime. It's, it's not a lighted sign. But the CHP doesn't notice either. Since I've been riding my bicycle on this segment of freeway, I get stopped by the highway patrol approximately once a year or about every one and a half percent one and a half percent of the times I'm out there. And he always gives me a real red light stop. He pulls in behind me. If I don't notice him immediately, he'll touch the siren. So I stop, I show my hands, he comes up and talks. And invariably he says, do you know why I stopped you? And I used to cop an attitude and I used to say, yeah, because you don't know that I'm legal on this segment of the freeway. <laughs> Bad attitude. Okay. <laughs> Once, and I quit just after this incident, the highway patrolman didn't say anything, but his body language said, hey, you're about to end up face down on the asphalt with both hands behind your back, both shoulders dislocated, arrested for resisting arrest, and then we won't prosecute, and everything will go away, except for my two dislocated shoulders. So bad attitude goes away now. In about 2013, I was at a Bay Point MAC meeting, and a highway patrol captain was there giving a presentation. I don't recall what his presentation was about, but as he left the room, I ran after him, and I said, I, I get stopped regularly on the freeway. Could you look into it? And he promised to. And since then, I have not been stopped formally by the highway patrol. Now, about once a year, they pull in behind me, about 20 feet behind. And I'm sure they have their blue and red lights flashing behind. But they don't light me up. 
So when I notice them, I turn around and look and stop and get off my bike. Over there, PA, he says, get back on your bike, keep riding, take the next off-ramp, which I do. And when we get about halfway down the off-ramp, he drives off. Once, and this was only last year, a highway patrol pulled up beside me. Now, I'm on the shoulder. He's in the traffic lane. He's got his blue lights on, his red lights on, and he says over his PA, I know you're legal out here, but I don't like it one bit. <laughs> and then he floored it. And, you know, like a teenager, except he's got a gigantic engine in his highway patrol car. It was really cool. So anyway, I would like to ask this, this august board if there is some way we can get bicycles off the freeway, because I don't like it one bit either. Thank you very much. Bruce, thank you so much. What a way to start a meeting now. Look, a little trivia, a little humor. And but some very basic uh, information, very good information. Uh, next comment, and this is the uh, final speaker card. De Debbie. Yeah. Good evening. Are you acting chair? I don't know even how to properly yeah. address you this evening. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'm the vice, vice Chair. I'm, yes, ma'am. Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Vice, Mr. Chair of Vice, I don't think so. I, I will say Vice Chair. Well, you know Bob. That was Karen's humor, not mine. Um, if you knew me, it might be apropos. But go it ahead. It might be apropos. I don't. I'm Debbie. Nice to meet you. Yeah. All right. Good to know. You're on a timer, Debbie. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I was actually coming to, to thank you tonight, so you might want to give me a little extra time. Um, so the uh, it, it did not make it out into the public sphere until after your agenda was published, which is why I'm speaking during public comment. Um, the Accessible Transportation Strategic Plan grant is conditionally recommended by staff for funding here, and I'm super excited um, that CCTA staff went through the effort of putting together this grant application, and I will say that um, I am the co-chair of the Health Task Force of the East Bay Leadership Council, and recently we have been partnering with the Transportation Task Force to look at some of the social determinants of health. Transportation happens to be one of those. So people's health is impacted by their ability to get to and from medical appointments, but it's also impacted by how much time they spend in their car and various other things, as you all are fully aware. And one of the things that we talked about addressing together as joint task forces is accessible transportation and we want to help with this we want to be a part of it and we're super excited that you invested the staff time um, expertise and that you will have some money to do some real digging around what the needs are and we look forward to partnering with you moving forward on it and thank you so much for putting the effort behind it and not just the words thank you for the thanks <laughs> um, we shall now uh, move. no other speaker cards anyone from the public Okay, going into approval of minutes. No approval. Sorry. First, second, any discussion? Call for the vote, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, moving into consent calendar. I missed everybody here. Got it. First and a second. Any? <laughs> Any discussion? Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. All right. Opposed? All right. Where are we? A legislative update? No, 4813. 813, where am I? Top of page 6. Because I'm not numbered on. In the consent. Here I'm. Page 6, next page. Right here. Major discuss. Here we go. There you go. A and uh, Administration Projects Committee, 4A13, Interstate 80, San Pablo Dam Road, Interchange Reconstruction. 4A13. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair and Board Members. Uh, Marvin Ramirez, and I'm the Construction Manager for the Authority. And this is uh, an action item where we're going to 
staff's going to ask the board to increase the construction allotment for uh, San Pablo Down Road Interchange Project, which has encountered a number of issues that I'm going to go over here briefly, <clears throat> and it's in need of uh, infusion of, of new money. So I'm going to give you a, a little history uh, on this project. We advertised on August 18th of 2015, opened September 29th. The engineer's estimate was original $15,945,000. Uh, uh, once we received the bidders, we had nine bidders come in. We awarded on November 18, 2015 to Boston & Wall, who is a local contractor. Uh, the, the duration of the project was estimated at 325 days. And uh, we proceeded and we gave the contractor the first working day uh, beginning January 18, 2016. Uh, one thing to note here is that the contractor, sub, uh, when he submitted his schedule, his baseline, what we call a baseline schedule, he had compressed the schedule from 325 days to 278 days. The, this is something that the authority allows in these contracts. It, it doesn't have to be that way. We can hold the contract to the 325 days, but uh, we feel that by... Uh, Allowing this, this flexibility, the contractor can be aggressive when he looks at the schedule and hopefully complete the contract quicker. But it's important because as we see over the number of issues that we're gonna, they're gonna mention in a little bit, uh, the compressed schedule definitely had an impact. Uh, this is a, a summary of the five lowest bidders. Uh, originally, the lowest bidder was back in construction. For some of the board members that were here at the time, you'll remember that the board ended up throwing out Vikings bid because it was not responsive and it went to the second bidder like I mentioned earlier, uh, personal and well. Uh, the thing to note here is that the percentage difference between the lowest bidder and the fifth highest bidder is, is 3%. Uh, an indication that the bidders, there was not a single bidder out there that saw an advantage of how, how to bid this contract. They all pretty much saw the same way. So it's hard to think that a contractor was trying to gain the contract documents as they went out to bid. This is a history of the construction allocation. In my previous slide, I forgot to mention that the lowest bidder was actually over a million dollars over the engineer's estimate. So when we awarded the contract, we already had a little bit hit a little bit of hate with the money that we had because we had to increase the construction alignment because the bidder was higher. But uh, then uh, the authority uh, changed some of the uh, supplemental and state furnished funds and that was revision number one. We staff came back to the board for revision two and we actually asked for an increase of $1,150,000. Uh, revision three was executed by the executive director where again it did not increase the construction allotment, but now we're asking you to approve uh, revision four, which will include, which increase the allotment by, to, by $610,500. And at the same time, we're asking the board to allow us to come back next month with a strategic amendment, uh, a strategic amendment to uh, bring some money from Central Avenue Phase Two project, and, and Hisham will be here to answer any questions you might have about that. So uh, this is uh, what how the contractor planned the work. It was supposed to end the first quarter of 2017. Due to a number of issues, the construction schedule was increased by 14 months. And, and this is uh, what we call it, an issue tracking, and it's also called the, the MISO chart. And it's just giving an indication of all the issues that were encountered during this project. Uh, on the left side, uh, the work that was contemplated was just the replacement of an existing pedestrian overcrossing. It was a little bit complicated because one of the uh, abutments where, where people land, it's, it's within a, the Riverside Elementary School. Uh, the work on the side is, is primarily realignment of Old Portal Road to make room for a new road ramp and extend or create an auxiliary lane from El Portal all, all the way to San Pablo Down Road. So some of the typical issues that we encounter is uh, contractor, I mean, or, or designer not estimating correctly. This is a, an issue where 
there was a handrail that needed to be installed because the slope was 6%, and it was originally estimated at 278 linear feet. It turned out that ultimately we needed 728 linear feet of rail, so that increased the cost of the contract by roughly $60,000. This is an uh, error where on the left side where you see the concrete, it's hard to tell that that's the grade that needed to be met. Uh, and the contract called for additional paving, where clearly you didn't have to put additional paving. You actually had to grind that existing sectional pavement and then put pavement over it. So that was a, a design error. Uh, another condition that was encountered frequently was different site conditions. This one was particularly uh, expensive because the way the work was contemplated is for the casting the whole piles to be done with no water, dry holes, much easier operation. And we encountered groundwater and that required mobilization of large tanks like they're shown in that picture, put in slurry, and the operation gets more complicated because you have to uh, circulate that slurry so that the holes don't, don't collapse. So that also is a, a, an ex example of a different site condition. So the, the, the missile chart that I showed earlier, the, those kind of issues, the, the three examples that I gave, those delayed the project approximately four months. So we're still doing pretty good considering the amount of work and issues that we have to, res to resolve. Um, I do want to say that there, it's a lot of credit to the field staff that they work very hard to resolve these issues. We uh, had to coordinate with PG&E, AT&T, Beymar, Sanitary District, City of San Pablo, Caltrans, the school district, and others to make the progress move forward. And in addition to uh, these uh, different site conditions and errors and omissions, we encounter issues connecting to existing facilities, which in effect are not really a design error. Uh, if you have a uh, drainage inlet that you need to connect to and it was estimated that the pipe was going to be 20 inch diameter and it turns out to be 18. But that's additional work and it's impact to the contractor that it's almost like it's like you really don't know all the conditions that are existing in the field at the time you go to the to do the work. So this is this is an example of an issue that was encountered when we were almost done with the project. We were supposed to connect to a uh, East Bay Mud water line that was going to provide irrigation to the new plants that we were planning. That's why it's like a last order of work. And when we try to connect to it, well, and, and we have documentation that East Bay Mud approved this location, it was already capped. So there's no way to access this water line. So we had to contact East Bay Mud and resolve the issue. They agreed that they have capped the water line, but nonetheless, they had to find another way to get the water where we needed it, it, because they do the installation of the pipe and they put their uh, meters, it took a long time to get the issue resolved. So ultimately, they came in and where that blue lines, they made the connection there, that's what we're tapping into the water. Then after that, the contractor had to extend the water line to where originally we were supposed to have, or close to where we were originally supposed to have the meter, and the work was completed. Another delay that we had was pg and &E. We had three locations where they were supposed to come and do the drop, the power drop, and all three of them were delayed. Um, I have some dates here. We originally asked them to come and connect locations one and two in July of 2016, but they really didn't complete the work until September of 2017. Uh, location three, which is the location near the school, we asked them to come in and connect it in July 2016 as well, and they didn't connect it until December of last year. So uh, over here, uh, the field team, again, worked very hard. The school allowed us to uh, basically go in and connect into their power so that we could put the lighting on the pedestrian overcrossing because without the lighting, you cannot open the pedestrian overcrossing, and then the work cannot continue. You cannot drop the old one in continue with the work. So this is, a, again, a lot of consideration by our partners as well. Locations one and two, we actually tap into existing Caltrans power sources and that allow the work to continue. But, but nonetheless, the contract couldn't close because 
we ha we didn't have the final PGME drop power drops, so that's a, another delay. And uh, there was another issue with the striping and signing at El Portal and at the intersection of El Portal and I eighty. And I'm going to go over them uh, here briefly. There were several issues, but I'm going to summarize a couple. Here uh, on the new alignment, the right lane will allow traffic to go through the intersection, but also make a right turn. Well, it turned out that if somebody was wanted to go straight, then it will back up all the traffic that wanted to turn right, especially during the commute hours. So that, you know, created a considerable backup. So we had to address that issue. And that took a long time because it's a redesign. You have to do traffic counts. You have to involve Caltrans. Caltrans has several units, traffic, safety, electrical. Everybody has to review it. And it, therefore, it takes some time to, to do the redesign. Eventually, when we completed the redesign, we made the right turn only, I mean, the right lane, a right turn only. This is at the opposite side of the freeway. That, that location was the on-ramp. This is the off-ramp for my 80 and over here the issue was that there were two left lanes that the leftmost lane got trapped into having to go back onto the freeway because that was the only, that was the lane to go in the opposite direction. So that was creating a conflict. So in order to address that conflict, we had to eliminate that right left turn lane and that allowed for better traffic flow through through the intersection where that left turn lane had the option of going straight or getting back onto the freeway. And uh, last, we were almost done with the project, the pedestrian overcrossing developed several cracks. Some of them are called shrinkage, some of them are uh, negative moment cracks. And uh, this is something that is ongoing still where we have a solution for it. We're going to apply a sealant. It's called methacrylate. Uh, but currently, we're getting bids from uh, from people that do this kind of work, and we haven't finalized the number. But once we get the bids and we collect the lowest bid, then we're going to go and proceed with this work. We believe that once we seal the deck, that Caltrans is going to accept it because this could potentially create long-term maintenance issues. During a field work, Caltrans uh, brought out what I consider the most concrete expert, and he said, would you seal it, and we'll accept it. So that's the way we're going with what he said. Hopefully that turns out to be correct. So uh, as a summary, the, the project encountered four months of delay, primarily due to the sheer number of issues that came up that were represented in the missile chart that I showed earlier. But on top of that, we encountered a 10th month delay due to the connection to the East Bay Bone meter, pg and power drops, striping and signing, and also the bridge deck where we're still trying to co close out. I think that's the, that is the last issue we need to address on this contract. So due to the four and 10 month delay, the contractor had to have additional people in the field. Uh, we, were, we were lucky that after the four month delay, we could close the field office, so that eliminated a lot of costs. So the remaining of the work, the managing of the home office, so that allows us to drop the cost. Nonetheless, the cost is $680,000. And uh, that's the next item where I'm gonna ask you to approve that change order. So going forward, like I mentioned earlier, we're gonna seal the deck. We're, we're having discussions with the common, uh, with the designer about responsibility, and um, we're, we're gonna seal the cracks and move on. We are in the process of removing the graffiti, which is the last thing we have to do before we turn it over to Caltrans. So uh, some of the lessons learned, I know that Commissioner Taxing is here and he always asks uh, what lessons did you learn? Well, I think the most important lesson is we need to bring in the CM team at the 65% PCNE, and, and that's our practice and that's what we like to do. In this particular instance, we couldn't do it because there was a timing with the federal funding. And if you bring it too soon, then the E76, you're not a time. There's, there's a lot of things that have to happen. So for that reason, we waited until it was at the, over the 90% uh, completion, and therefore we couldn't get enough good comments in there to maybe avoid some of these things. We also believe going forward, especially in urbanized areas, we need to do a better job of finding utilities so that we know where they are when we go to the field and we know how to 
put them in the contract so that they are now uh, we know where they are and we don't have conflicts in construction. When we do utility relocation, it's very important that we have full-time inspector over here on this project. We did not do that. It's extremely important because then when you go out to the field and do the construction, you know where they are. We also believe that the designers could use some class detection software. That's what they encounter the plants. The program will analyze the plants and will identify conflicts uh, automatically, and, uh, and that will help resolve some of the errors that they have on their end. We need, a, we need to do a better job enforcing the designer's quality control plan. Uh, we need to increase verification and do the design of existing facilities and increase contingency in urban areas because some of these conflicts probably cannot be avoided overall. So with that, staff is asking um, the board to approve resolution 5057P, which will increase the construction amount by an amount of $600,500. And that will, be the, that will bring the new total value of the contract to $21,763,596. In addition to that, authority would like staff to seek with that concurrence to amend measure uh, to amend measure J strategic plan to return on four hundred and thirty six thousand four hundred and four dollars from Central Avenue project into San Pablo Down Road project. And in return, uh they command an identical amount from the twenty twenty step to Rice Central Avenue to phase two. So with that I'm open to any questions and also Hisham is available to answer any questions regarding the strategic plan amendment. Um, before we get it to to the board, I'd like to to um, make a couple of comments here. We ha we heard this through EPC, and it was uh, we vetted it pretty good. And I might ask Newell to kind of give. Could you summarize kind of how we arrived at what we arrived at? Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I just have to say this is probably the best presentation I've seen in all the years I've been here because it's transparent. It lays out every little thing that happened. This final change is 2.9% of the contract. Um, this is one of the oldest sections of freeway on I-80, and I think what um, was really just mentioning, we're going to have to use greater contingencies because there's no field documentation. We don't know what's out there. All the other areas we're building in, there's great documentation. Um, but I think staff has done a deep dive to sort this out, and behind the scenes, we've heard they've been working and we've gotten updates on it, APC, over the past 10, 12 months, but particularly there's clearly errors um, um, with the design team. They're in negotiations to get that rectified, so there'll be some um, monies coming from that. But I think from APC's point of view, and we were really critical over this, um, that this was exceptionally well vetted. And here's the really good news that I think we all concluded, because <coughs> most of it been out there. If you've been through that intersection, wow, what an improvement. And I was, I was there once before we did the little turn change. It is so smooth. That's the place I dive off of now if, if I'm in that area. So I think from APC's point of view that um, the lessons learned, everything we'd want to normally ask was laid out as says transparent. And I, I really want to commend you um, and our agency for standing up and saying, here's what happened, here's how we're going forward. Um, and I think we uh, were unanimous in supporting this. All right. Oh. We'll move now on to the board questions of staff. I agree with Newell. My only question goes way back to the beginning um, when staff thought this would be a 325-day project, and I understand the delays, so, you know, that went by the wayside. But why did the contractor come to you saying that it would be less? Was there some sort of incentive for them to finish earlier? Or which I would still stick with the 325 and if I met it, but with all – of the problems that they encountered, I still haven't figured out why they thought this would take less time. So, so the problems would have been there no matter what, right? right? So, the, most likely there would have been delays. So, the the contractor, the, his his desire when he puts a he compresses the schedule is that he's going to have less overhead. So, by having less overhead, then he's he's he can come in do the work and and get there out sooner, right? By the way, we also benefit under those circumstances because we don't have to be there 
uh, as much. But but ultimately, it's it's a decision that the contractor makes because he feels that he can get the work done in that amount of time. So what happened to us is that is that he was never able to get into a good rhythm to get the work done because it didn't matter where he went, there was an issue. But but that we have to take responsibility for that. No, and I get that. I I guess if I were a contractor, I'd think I want to get it finished sooner because I'll have these savings. But I don't know that I would commit to it in a contract because if you couldn't meet it, then there's – anyway, it's an esoteric conversation, but thank you. Any other questions, comments from the staff? Dave. Dave. Yeah. <clears throat> Ivan, you threw me a little bit at the end. I thought we were looking at – what, 436000 and change for the STIP funds. Then you said a like number after we were talking about millions. Is the STIP fund 434 or a couple million, or, or what's the total STIP fund on that? So um, so I don't know if you want to come in here, Sean, but, yeah, we're, we're asking for 600. Uh, I want to get back to the number right now. It's on my, one of my first slides. So it's a two-step, and I don't know if I'm going to answer the question, but if, if you can uh, ask. A... So right now on this chart, we're asking for a revision four, which is six hundred and ten thousand five hundred dollars. That is coming from Mr. J funds that are already part of the con of the of the construction or the project, the overall project funds. Mm -hmm. When we come back next month with the strategic plan amendment, we're going to ask for four hundred thirty-six thousand dollars. Of uh, STIP funds, right? Okay. I think you just answered. It sounded like you said a like number when you were talking in millions, and I'm going, did I miss something? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, all right. The other thing is, I know we ask this all the time because we're trying to, but I don't want to get back into the argument of geographical equity, et cetera, but we probably should have some kind of a, a pie graph or something of where STIP funds go uh, throughout the quadrant. Reason being is about a year or so ago, San Ramon traded uh, away their future STIP funds, and if I thought I could hide it, well, I can't. All the members are here tonight, uh, and you feel a little guilty when you start voting away STIP funds because none of it's coming to you anyway. But uh, I, I know we do it at Mobile Source on on some of the grant things uh, about the equity to the different counties. Maybe if we could do it just to get an idea of where STIP funding has been going or will be going when we do these trade-offs. Mr. Trotter. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to sort of echo a little bit what Dave's saying. Um, and, and with regard to sub, this sub-regional equity concept that's always been there and how we, we allocate the STIP funds around between the different sub-regions. Um, has any thought been given uh, to instead of, you know, having this pre-commitment of STIP or maybe having a conditional pre-commitment of STIP funds from an accounting standpoint, if there happens to be a recovery um, from the design firm, whether those monies instead could go back into the Central Avenue project? Absolutely, and very good question. If we, we're doing this temporarily, basically, until we get the design firm to give us back some of the money. If, if we get 436000 or more, we will come back to the board and basically reverse this action, which basically will put back the Major J money in the STIP and eliminate our pre-commitment of the STIP funds. So my, I understand you're talking about that in future time. I'm talking this, about this in terms of giving direction now in present time. Uh, I think you can do that as long as we collect money from the designer. I mean, it's going to be contingent on uh, how much we collect from the designer. Thank you. <coughs> Janet. Um, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Tom's uh, right on. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the con I, I did have a, a – I did talk to staff, and, and most of all of what was said I understand, and I actually – uh, agree with the comment about this is really um, putting it up front about uh, whose mistake it was and the honesty I really uh, admire. Um, the the one place where I um, am concerned about it is uh, uh, 
is will we ever get the project on I-80 done? It's so old that people don't even remember the earmark, <laughs> the name of the uh, person who initiated the earmark, uh, which then got moved to a different congressman, but uh, that started the I-80 Kendall Avenue uh, project. It's that, that's how old it is. Um, it was Ellen Houser. Do you know Ellen Houser? Yeah. Um, and I knew Ellen when I was early in my career. Um, <laughs> but I remember that one time that we were all sitting together. <laughs> but uh, it, it was really old. And um, so it's like we wanted to. Central Speaker is on Senator Yancey's desk today. So we have some people that are going to speak on that. Case two, I think that some of us have heard, heard from him that he would have a problem with the Yellow Track and traffic conditions in Kendall Avenue. Is he just listening to statements that we get from Roger and Jim Stewart and Brown and others that are concerned about the Yellow Track traffic safety and just being shut off on Fifth Avenue and Kendall? And the project is already this point, the project based on what's being estimated for approximately spring 20, would have already 7.7 million fixed funds for that. So that would be another fiscal funding back in September from the Federal Reserve Board to fund the program for the spring 21. And adding 436,000 fiscal money would not add to the measure, but not to the fact that so the total funding is.
R. It should be, thank you, it should be S-H-E-E-R. So, um, and then finally, one of the things that the APC committee recommended, um, and I don't know whether we need to add that to the, to, to the action tonight, but we recommended to uh, prepare a letter to the East Bay Mud Board and to the CPUC regarding uh, PG&E because um, their foot dragging on this cost us a lot of time and a lot of money. And this isn't the only time. I mean, this is normal for them. And I, and I, think, uh, I think agencies that are affected by, by their delays need to let the appropriate people know about it so maybe they can uh, motivate them to be a little more um, <clears throat> cooperative. Does that need to be added to the, to the? Well, I was going to make a motion, Action. but okay. I think we want to uh, cool. maybe hear from our director I, uh, about well, this last item. Julie's got a well, yeah, sure. I, Julie's I, got I was question. actually the one, and I'll I'll fess up. At the APC meeting, I was so incensed <laughs> about the lack of cooperation from our utilities that I made a rather rash motion that we send that letter. In thinking about it later and talking with staff, I think it was exactly that, a rash motion. We have to continue to work with these people. And if we go to the media and start sending them nasty letters, they're not going to want to work with us quite as much. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to rescind that recommendation that came out of APC because I think it was done in haste and in fury. And in thinking about it better, I think the cooler heads of our staff should prevail, and we should not do that. They have to work with them, and they will continue to work with them more collaboratively if we don't beat them up. Director. Yeah, I'm actually, we're actually members of the International Partnering Institute, and they have their annual meeting. PG&E is a member. And so I propose that we have a conversation with Pierre and others from PG&E and, and remind them that we're a partnering agency and they're part of partnering. This is part of partnering. You start duking it out in the media, then they're going to say what they want to say and we're going to say what we want to say and, and you're, the message is going to be lost. And then we have, you have five phases of, we have five phases of 684 or six or seven phases. Every phase, northbound HOV lane, southbound HOV lane, those have utility interaction. Everybody knows utility companies sometimes are hard to deal with. And so what we, what we propose is do a better search up front to make sure we identify those, those utilities because what we get is sometimes we hit utilities that we don't know that are there or capped, so we don't have good information. And uh, Commissioner Armitage hit the nail on the head. Out there in Interstate 80, everything's old and the, the as-builts are terrible. We don't have the same problems at Balfour. Everything's going pretty smoothly. And so everything's going very smoothly because the, the utilities have been identified. It's a newer infrastructure. And so there you have great cooperation. So I propose that we, and we did make a few phone calls to elected officials, and they did acquiesce on change order numbers and things like that to pay us. We haven't, we're, we're still in dispute over the cost of moving the utilities ex initially on, on San Pablo Dam Road. That's a, about a $3 million dollar issue if we win that we get three million dollars and then we can argue about you know what part of the money that that money goes into and we haven't completed our discussions with AECOM but my fear is if we start duking this out in the media we are going to get an even worse service than we have before and we're going to try to improve that through partnering and so give us an opportunity to do that and if we run into roadblock then we'll ask for help and maybe we do send a letter ultimately well, the problem is if, if nobody tells these people that they've got a problem, they're just going to think they're the greatest agency in the world and, and uh, everybody loves them. And I don't think we ever talked about going to the media with this. I, thought, I, I think we can, write a, uh, we can write a diplomatic letter and say, look, we've had these experiences and we just want to share with you that, that uh, m maybe there's a better way of doing this. You know, we're willing to do our part. You know, maybe we can work with you. You know, something along those lines. I th I think to just be quiet because you don't want to rile them up is not the right approach. It just you know it just leaves them thinking that 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 they're the best people in the world and they're doing a great job and they're not. You know, this is a 
This is a problem in every construction project is getting, getting these utilities to get their work done in time, and it costs the public a lot of money. It costs private developers a lot of money. I, th I think they need to hear it. But, you know, I, we never talked about going to the media. We talked about... Actually, we did. Yeah. Huh, didn't we? It's in the recommendation, yeah. Well, uh, maybe Julie did, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We voted on it. Well, so I don't know. I mean, can we get a happy compromise that somebody does a does a, uh, a diplomatic could. letter and, and, you know, does it in a way that we're, you know, we're looking to collaborate and try to find a better way or something like that? I go back to my motion, which uh, was to move the staff recommendation and thank them. And I would just say as part of that motion that let's, let's what our executive director is saying, staff will handle it in an appropriate way, in a professional way. It lets them use their professional discretion of how to deal with that, and they have a plan in place. And, and I think I would ask if you want to know what it is, you can kind of sit down with them. I don't think we want to do it in public, but I think they have some good solutions. Mr. Trotter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do support the motion. I do have some questions about it. First of all, looking at the staff report, do we want to say anything about the, it was part of this motion that we are specifically, that we are rescinding the second sentence in terms of the changes from committee that are on page two of six of the staff report, that that, 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 rec that particular request by APC is rescinded or is now being rescinded by the full board. That's point one. I think that's an appropriate direction. And it doesn't, I don't I think it should be made expressly. The other is, I'm not sure this is the right time or whether there's another matter, whether we talk about the, the pre-commitment of funding issue on this motion or are we going to do it on a subsequent motion? I want to make sure that that, the thought that I raised earlier at, at the appropriate time does get included. It might be now if that's what your motion is. Does your motion encompass yeah. that or not because you weren't clear? Yeah, yeah. I, I would think we would. Just to ask Ivan, and um, is, is that appropriate that we could um, make as part of this motion that um, whatever funds are um, captured from a design recovery process that they then go back to clear the step? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's, that's what we want. And I also agree with Mr. Trotter. We're substituting the loud. Um, uh, it's a conditional pre-commitment subject to being, you know, reversed based upon the outcome of those discussions. Do you second the motion? I didn't no, second no, the motion. No, he, we already have a second. The question is whether those amendments are acceptable yes. to maker and seconder. Okay. Um, before we call for the vote, we do have a first and a second. Is there anyone from the public wishing to step forward and chat about this? All right. We have a first and we have a second. Any more discussion? Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. You ready? I don't you yes. more, you've more or less covered it already. So. Yes, it's, so this, the second item also is, is an action item, and this is in regards of board approving the contract change order to compensate the contractor for his extended uh, overhead and supervision in the field. So I have, I'm open to any questions regarding that item. Okay. Move approval. Second. First and a second. Any more discussion? Any questions? Okay, we'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Planning committee. Anything? None. Uh, correspondence communications? Associated committee reports? Uh, commissioner and staff? Chair's comments? I have nothing. Commissioners? I did. How the heck can you go to Australia and not talk to Tatson and I? What's. Didn't say anything to us? <laughs> um, exec executive staff report, comments? It's, fire, it's fireside chat season, so we're reinvigorating the fireside chats. This is probably the third round. It was, in, it was started when, when Ross first got here to introduce Ross to all of the city managers, town managers in, of the 19 cities in the county and the staffs. And... It, we're starting the process again. We have a world record, Guinness Book of World Records. We did four fireside chats. We started in Martinez, went to Brentwood, went to Antioch, and ultimately ended up at the uh, Tri-Delta Transit. Tri-Delta Transit had eight of their staff members there with a whole booklet on what they do and how we partner together to deliver innovations for our transit 
system in the eastern part of Contra Costa. And so we're, we're, we're going through that. I think we've, Terry Ann, we've had every city said yes. And so we're, we're going through that process now, engaging Tim, Tim Hale and all of the team here with their executive staff. It's, so it's pretty nice. So if you want to join in, we had Mayor Taylor. I think you gained a lot of insight to kind of the relationship and the reason, some of the reasons why Balfour Projects is going so well is because we have a great relationship with city staff, the traffic engineer, Steve Kersavan. He saves us money like Ivan on a daily basis. He makes great decisions on how to accelerate construction projects in the city of Brentwood, so we appreciate that. He's a part of the mayor's staff. That's why he's so good. <laughs> and then um, uh, Balfour is going very, very well. One of the reasons why is we're not hitting a lot of utilities because there's not a lot of utilities out there because yeah. it's a brand new facility. I, I thought it was because of the mayor. Oh, oh, that's sorry. I apologize. It is because of the mayor and it's, it's great decision making they had over the years. I did go to Australia. I was invited to be the keynote speaker at the Australian Road Research Board's annual meeting. I gave the keynote speech, and then they took me to make to give an interview to a guy named Anthony Funnel. He is the he does a radio show called Future Tense, and the country of Australia wants to do what we're doing. They want to get into the testing program of connected autonomous vehicles, new technologies to understand the framework and the regulatory environment that they need to support that. And so I talked about the value, at least from a small organization's perspective. You know, we, we call ourselves a country upon within a country, but we're really not. But it's helping us make sure that we have the right regulatory framework. And so we laid all that out. And then I, I came back and I participated on a panel called Panel 2032. And it was, what if it was 2032, looking back to 2018? And so I played the part of a rich, retired person. So I really didn't care. And so <laughs> most of the answers was, I don't really care because I'm retired. As long as I can have the vehicle come pick me up, I don't care about our regulatory framework and all this. But So it was, it was a lot of fun. The next day, I, I was asked to be the keynote speaker at a PR conference. I used to be a member of PRC, and it's an international road Federation that brings in the more the countries that have certain features like snow and ice and they have traffic operations that are embedded in their daily activities. And we're, we went around the, the developing countries to talk about breakaway anchors, about traffic operation strategies. In this case, it was surface texture. So it's rumored that I love uh, pavement more than I love ITS or technology, which I don't know which is which. but. I got to give a speech on surface textures on bringing down the noise. So Balfour is going to have open graded asphalt road around the surface. Is that correct, Ivan? Yes. Yeah. And, and the idea there is to really show how quiet that pavement can be. And so when it's open, you're going to have a very quiet road surface because it's porous in nature. It'll last a long time. It'll be asphalt rubber. And so we're excited to bring that to eastern part of Contra Costa. So when you when you ride over, you hear that nothing. So it's going to be great. So, I, and then the, I think the highlight of, of some of, and I've been here eight years, and I, the highlight is Lindsay and I went to talk to the middle school teachers. We invited five middle school and high school teachers to the Redefining Mobility Summit. They came away saying, I'm, we're not sure if we're teaching these kids the right skill set to deal with the future technologies. And so we gave a speech to the, the teachers that lead this program called Project Lead the Way, PLTW. And we would like to create a curriculum to get middle school girls excited about STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. And Chevron, after our presentation, they liked it so much, they said they wanted to help sponsor that effort. And so yeah. Lindsay and I, and I think CCTA in general, the staff, we're going to try to figure out a way of getting the young middle school girls excited about the next generation of technology because I think that's going to be the future of making sure that we have enough staff to do all these wonderful things that we're trying to do now and how do you maintain the, that, that infrastructure and those kinds of things. So I thought that was one of the highlights. I was tired. I was jet lagged, but I mean, it was a great, it was a, it was a great opportunity for us. So we'll, we'll keep you more informed of that. We may need your help in the future. So if there's no questions, that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Did you hold, hold these, uh, these meetings in Australia at Star City? No, oh. this is in Brisbane. It wasn't in Sydney. Sorry, it was in Brisbane, Australia. And then coming back, my plane was delayed two and a half hours. I, I didn't make the, the APC meeting. But he did call in. I would call. I would yeah, have called you in. You did call Absolutely. in. Absolutely. All right. Go home. Yeah, you uh, said go, said home. go home. Um, Calendars are attached. Um, at this point in time, we'd like to move into closed session.
So you need to make sure all the microphones. Back in open session, and we gave direction. And at this point in time, I'll adjourn the meeting. No reportable action. No reportable action.